Hey everybody, welcome to the Sana Q&As. This is Meredith Miller from Inner Integration answering your questions. This one says, Hi Meredith, I've been torturing myself in my mind thinking about the ways I acted far below my personal expectations of myself in my relationship with my ex, Narc. I am a kind, gentle, loving person who enjoys connecting on a feelings level with my friends, family, and love partners. I am often shy and introverted, but enjoy a good laugh and a night out occasionally and true, truly care about the feelings of others. But things went to the extremes when I was with my narc. For example, he'd insist we stay out longer at the bar than I'd want. I'd have an extra beer or two. Then out of the blue, he would very covertly gaslight and provoke with meanness to get a reaction from me in front of everyone. And he'd sit back and smirk while I would look crazy for suddenly getting upset and ruining a fun night. This type of poking and provoking happened constantly at home. He would start an argument just for his own entertainment, say all sorts of backhanded compliments, insults, or say blatantly unkind and hurtful things, or outrageous lies, and when I would get upset, he would escalate the situation to a point I would snap. I would say horrible things back at him. I broke kitchen china or grab his stuff and throw it in the yard and order him to leave. And then I'd cool down and we would kiss and make up. He loved his power in being able to make me act in ways I never would unless pushed to breaking. He loved to create these dramas. I would feel horrible later and apologize but still feel shame because I felt I had been abusive to him. And he would tell me I had... I had been when it suited him, but intellectually I know that he had set out from the beginning to make sure a fight took place. I've learned this term reactive abuse and it's helped me understanding the dynamic, but sometimes I still feel like I was abusive without intending to be. Can you shine some of your insight on this topic in regards to healing and forgiving oneself? Thank you so much. So yeah, what you just described is basically how the devil gets you to do his bidding. The oppressor pushes you and put, provokes you until you respond in kind, you know, responding with violence, responding in some way, and then you become the bad guy, not only in his eyes, but in your own, when you go against your own integrity, what you actually would want to do, who you actually want to be. Maybe you even get in trouble with the law, with something else. It's a double whammy, and this is a big trap. It's a big trap. They get you to focus on your reaction to the abuse and not the abuse itself. The only part that you have control over is how you react. That's the part. So what you're describing is the parts where you lost control. You lost control of yourself right? You let him provoke you. You let him push you. You let him gaslight you to the point where you broke. You, you just totally lost control over yourself. Then you regretted later having gone against your integrity, right? Here it is right here. When you realize you're behaving out of the normal, when you're looking at your behavior and you're like, oh my God, that's not me. I would never do that. Whoa, what am I doing? Major red flag. Stop right there and start reevaluating because something is not okay. If you're looking at your own behavior and you're recognizing this is not me, something is really out of the normal here. What's going on? That's when you need to really evaluate, right? When you behave outside your integrity, you're going to feel worse about yourself. Your self-respect is going to crash, your self-worth, your self-esteem. And now guess what? Now you're trapped deeper in the abuse cycle. It's all part of the game. That's why they wear away at your self-esteem, your self-worth, your self-respect. The worst part about it is they trick you into doing it yourself. You're the one who chooses your actions and your attitudes. That's all your responsibility. It's no one else's responsibility. It's easy for us to say, well, he made me, he made me feel, he made me do. No, he did and he did but we choose how we respond to that. We choose. It doesn't mean he's right. It doesn't mean that wasn't wrong what he did. It doesn't mean he's at fault, but it means if you respond to that with an equal back and forth, then you're just becoming as guilty as him in the game. It's all part of the game. It's how they trick you into doing that. And then the worse you feel about yourself, 
the worse likely you are to leave. They know that. They know they have to wear you down because you have to feel down if you're going to stay in that abuse cycle, if they're going to keep you trapped there. So if you want to get out of that, you have to get back into your integrity. You have to start acting as you would act as yourself, being yourself, being yourself. They love this. The drama, the poking a fight, making you uncomfortable or upset. Like you said, it's all for his own entertainment. You know that. That's 100% true. You've seen that. It's like a dopamine thrill for them, especially for psychopaths. They, they have like an extreme need for the dopamine thrill. Watch out for dopamine seekers. Watch out for people who need to do crazy stuff to stimulate their dopamine. I'm not saying every dopamine seeker is a psychopath, but I'm saying it very often goes hand in hand, right? Some other person who's not could be maybe just desperately trying to feel. They're trying to feel something. They need some kind of rush. Something else is going on in their life. Maybe that's what makes them feel alive. Maybe everything else in their life is just utterly boring and they can't find meaning in life not necessarily a psychopath, but the psychopath does seek out thrills. They do seek out the dopamine spikes. It's what they need. Like they feed on that. It's one of their favorite forms of supply. So watch out for that. Watch out for the gaslighting that you described. You know, this dynamic too, especially in public, how they do that, you know, where he would trap you into this idea of staying, right? Instead of calling Uber or going home for yourself and just letting him stay, because you could do that. You don't have to stay there. That's a choice. You know, when, when he's like, oh, we got to stay for another beer or two, you can say, okay, no problem. Have fun. Stay at home. And you book and you call the Uber or you drive yourself home if you're not drinking, whatever, or take public transit. But you don't have to stay there. Recognize you have that choice. You don't have to stay there. That was his invitation. And you accepted the invitation. And the invitation was a trap. You know, and then he would start putting you down. He would say those little subtle things, the gaslighting. In public, they do this thing, which is like dog whistling. And there's an expression, dog whistle politics, where a politician will use, they'll drop certain words like neurolinguistic programming, and, and, it, and it has a meaning to certain people, people who are looking for that. They're looking for the certain language, and they know the politician's speaking to them. Well, the way I describe dog whistling in this kind of situation with the gaslighting and, and the interpersonal relationship is when you're in a group of people, and this could be out with your friends at a bar or whatever, and this definitely happens in family gatherings. The whole family's there, and the narcissistic parent or sibling or aunt or whomever starts dog whistling whomever they're abusing. And maybe they're abusing their child or their sibling or whomever. And they'll say something that everybody else at the table or in the room is just like, it was just like a normal thing. It didn't mean anything. This could happen at work. This definitely happens at work environments. When you're sitting in, in like a meeting and someone is abusing you and they'll say that thing and, and it, it'll just drive you insane. It's a dog whistle, only you can hear it. Nobody else can hear it. It just sounds like regular words to them, nothing out of the ordinary, but it's driving you insane because you know they're abusing you. You know they're digging, they're provoking, they're trying to get you to react. And then if you react, everybody's like, oh my God, what's wrong with her or what's wrong with him? You know, because they didn't get it. They didn't, they didn't hear the dog whistle. They didn't know that was a setup for you. So it'll make you feel like you're going crazy. And if you respond to that, you could look like you're the one going crazy. That's why it's called crazy making. It's called crazy making. You know, now, now you're torturing yourself. You use this word torturing yourself. It's because you're thinking about it. You're going over and over and over again, right? And the thoughts and then the emotions and the downward spiral crash. It's, it is torture. And then there's the self-sabotage and all that. The only way out of that is self-forgiveness. You have to transform that regret that you have, right? The regret that you have. So what would you do if you could do that over? When you think about what you did, just think about one example at a time. Think about the last time you were out in public when he provoked you and you did this, or the time you broke the kitchen china, or the time you threw his stuff outside. Just one example. Start with one example, maybe the most pressing one, the one that's the most emotional right now. Look at it, what happened. Look at the decisions you made. Recognize where you went wrong. If you could reverse engineer that, if you could go back, what would you do differently? Instead of throwing all his stuff out the lawn, instead of smashing all the kitchen china, instead of whatever you did, 
What would you do differently if that were happening right now? If you had a do-over, there are no do-overs in life, but if you had a do-over, what would you do differently, right? And so then start to run that through your mind and imagine yourself doing that instead. Imagine if you had done this instead of that. Imagine yourself actually doing that. Now in your mind, you are transmuting the mistake into a lesson. You're transmuting the mistake into a lesson. It's a lot easier to release the heavy feelings then. A lot easier. What do you wish you did differently? You can't change his behavior. You can sit here and you can wish you didn't do all this and that and the other, but all of that is out of your control. What you're really upset about right now, what's really torturing you are your own actions, your own actions that you took. So what do you wish that you did differently? Envision that in your mind and start to overwrite the old program. So instead of beating yourself up, you're teaching yourself, if I'm ever in a situation like that again, this is what I'm doing instead. I'm doing this. I'm going to empower myself. I'm not accepting that invitation to, to put myself at that level, to respond at that level. I'm going to take the higher path. I'm going to do this instead. Okay, that's how I recommend anytime you have regrets about things, and we all do. What you're describing here, you're not alone. We all did things outside of our integrity, even if it was just the thing that we accepted, because accepting something is an action. It's, it's saying, okay, it, maybe it's an inaction, right? The enabling piece, but it's an action. It's, it's saying, okay, I'm, I'm not going to look at that. I'm just going to pretend like it's okay. I'm just going to accept it. We're just going to go on. Sometimes that's what we're most angry about. Sometimes it's not like an actual active thing that we did. It was more of a passive thing, the acceptance. And sometimes like you're describing, they're actual actions that we took against our own integrity because we let the crazy making drive us crazy. So when you have regrets, there's a specific way that I teach people how to reprogram them. I have a new exercise out there. It's called um, reprogramming flashbacks and self-talk. Reprogramming the flashbacks and the self-talk is very similar. And I named the three primary kinds, the three primary kinds of flashbacks and self-talk. If it's this kind, use this reprogramming. If it's this kind, which is the regret, use this programming. And if it's this kind, use that. But regret is one of those three. It's a very short, it's less than 20 minutes, right? And it teaches you how to do this. It teaches you the technology. It's not a guided visualization. It's a lesson in teaching you how to use this technology in your own mind to rewrite the things that you regret, to rewrite the things that were out of your control, to rewrite the things that were in your control, and to rewrite the negative self-talk that's constantly going through your mind that's keeping you stuck and trapped in that reality in the past, living in the past. So this is one of the bonuses also that's included in my self-care mastery course, which is gonna help you to get to the roots of this dynamic so you don't repeat it again. We can sit here and we can just keep putting it outside of ourselves and we can go online and we can learn everything about the narcissist, the psychopath, the sociopath, the borderline, whomever. We can learn everything about them. We can really get into their minds and figure out why they tick and all that. And, and that might be temporarily relieving to understand why, because that mechanism is just so, what is that, right? When you first start looking at it, it's relieving to see that. But keep in mind that all of that is outside of you. And, and you can learn all you want about that, but that doesn't mean you're not gonna keep repeating the same patterns. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna heal the root of the issues that you're dealing with, right? That is the work that we can do for ourselves cultivating next level self-love. We can't change or fix anyone else. We can only heal ourselves and lead by example. It's up to others whether they will change or not. It's entirely up to them. The only thing that we can change is ourselves. And when we change ourselves, everything in our lives start to change. So if you are curious about my, my self-care mastery course, check it out. I'm putting the link below. You can read more information on the page that I have there. I'm already seeing some great comments in there on people who are going through the process and upgrading their level of self-care. They're learning to master this. They're just stepping into the five domains of self-care now. I'm really excited to hear from more of you going through this course to see how you're making these changes in your life, how you're empowering yourself, how you are cultivating the next level of self-love by taking the reins of your destiny in your hands because it all starts with self-responsibility. It's so much easier to put the blame outside of ourselves. And I'm not saying it was your fault because what that person did was on them. That was their responsibility. 
but nothing truly changes in life until we take the self responsibility piece until we realize what in us we can change to transform our lives those are the tools that i'm giving you in this course i'm sending you a big hug